I think we can start. So good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we are starting now the third panel, and uh, uh, as you will uh, see, pretty much most of the participants are online. And uh, so the third panel is on the question that we are asking is, how do sustainability standards affect decision of firms? So pretty much we move from data to the perspective of uh, investor, and now we are looking to the perspective of the firm. And we are really try to figure out uh, how, let's say, all this uh, uh, discussion that we just had this morning regarding, you know, uh, standards and the role that standards are having in, uh, uh, you know, helping uh, to achieve uh, um, determine, let's say, some, some of the objective, we can discuss if it is climate change or biodiversity. I will include also this uh, argument into our discussion. Uh, will have uh, or will have uh, an impact or is affecting the decision of the firms. And uh, uh, as uh, you can see from uh, the program, I don't know if we can see, okay, the, the speaker are here, so welcome. I'm, welcoming, uh, I'm happy to welcome our speaker. Well, I'm starting with uh, Marcin, that is the first on the, uh, at, le at least on the screen. And, uh, uh, you know, Marcin has been uh, capetic. He has been cited several times this morning, uh, most of your works. So, you know, I don't need to present him too much, but clearly he's a professor of finance at Imperial College of London, uh, Imperial College London. He, his main interest among different uh, things are uh, sustainable investment, and uh, he will talk today uh, about uh, disclosure. Uh, on top of this, he's also clearly interested on topics like financial stability and financial intermediation. He's doing a lot of things, including to be a research advisor at the European Central Bank, and he was also for, uh, the president of the European Finance Association. Uh, unfortunately, the second speaker that is in the list here, so Andre Caroli, uh, he just wrote to me this night, past night, that uh, he got COVID, and so he was getting the flu and uh, he didn't feel well to participate. But I will, in some sense, uh, 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 he sent to me the slide, so I will use part of, the, of his presentation and I will talk uh, a little bit on, on, on his, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on what he was planning to, to say. And, uh, uh, and then I'm looking to the second one in the screen, that is Irene. So Irene Monasterolo, she is a professor of climate finance at the DEC Business School and a DEC Risk Climate Impact Institute in Nice. Uh, she has contributed to understand the role of finance in the low carbon transition and the implication of climate change in investment decision and on financial stability. She is, pro she is proposing uh, a sort of science-based classification of asset exposure to climate transition risk that has been applied to several financial supervisors and institutions in the European Union, including the European um, Central Bank, the European Banking Authorities, EIOPA, and, and so on. And uh, uh, the last one in the screen is, uh, is a sense, representing the uh, really the industry, so uh, is Enrico Moretti Polegato, is the chairman of the Adora and is also the deputy chairman and the executive director of Geox. Uh, I, I think that you know this type of company. And uh, is also in charge of the supervision of the internal control function. So he will really tell us from the perspective of the firm, what does it mean in some sense to try to provide uh, information and try to, uh, let's say, uh, to respond to the request that on one side the accountant and on the other side regulators are asking to firm to provide information regarding uh, climate or all the other issues related to, uh, let's say, to sustainability. But uh, let me start from uh, uh, the first, so the beginning, lady first. So we are starting with uh, uh, Irene Monasterolo. I want to remind you that uh, the topic of this panel is how do sustainability standards affect decision of firms? And uh, I'm asking to Irene why and now or should climate risk, both in this case transition and physical, affect the decision process of firms, i.e. in particular governance, business models, strategy and cash flow. So Irene, the floor is yours. Okay, Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you Good. and for the invitation, Loriana. 
today we are going to discuss how, uh, I mean, based on, uh, let's say, a decade of experience in uh, climate financial risk disclosure and financial risk assessment, both at firm and investor level, I would like to bring some insights of what we learned and what still we need to, uh, to explore where are the gaps and potentially how to address them. Next slide, please. So why should firms and investors do climate financial risk assessment? Well, to understand on the one end, what are the risks and potential losses related to such risks, so both physical and transition risk they are exposed to, and on the other end, how to make an impact I mean, by, for instance, rebalancing their portfolio and reallocating capital from high carbon to low carbon activities. Here on the left, you see a um, stylized picture of the double side relation between climate change and finance. On the one hand, climate change uh, by a physical and transition risk uh, affects finance, in particular what we showed with our research. Uh, it affects risk perception that, uh, of investors, that in of firms and investors that in, ter uh, in turn determines their investment decision. Indeed, firms and investors decide to allocate capital into either high carbon or low carbon ac uh, activities based on their financial risk assessment. That's why introducing climate into financial risk assessment is crucial because it affirms, it affects investment decision uh, by making capital more or less available and either more or less expensive for firms, imagine, for instance, interest rate on loans. And in terms, financial actors' climate risk assessment influence the realization of the scenarios by adjusting, by influencing, sorry, firms' investment decisions. So there is this double side relation that uh, matter, and that's where climate financial risk assessment gets cr crucial. Next, next slide, please. So, uh, but how much this would matter then for uh, an investor? And here we come to the risk side. So already in 2017, we developed the climate stress test of the financial system, uh, where we looked at the implication of disorderly transition scenarios, so scenarios characterized by introduction of uh, um, latent carbon, uh, carbon pricing um, on investors' portfolio, depending on their exposure uh, or to firms and activities that we classified into what we call the climate policy relevant sectors. This classification accounted not only for emissions, so scope one, two, and three as the standard classification, but also for the uh, other dimensions that matter, in particular in a forward-looking dimension. So when you want to see how well a company will perform in a climate, uh, in a 1.5 or 2 degrees scenario. And these are the energy technology profile, uh, their business model, so input sustainability, and also uh, the cost sensitivity to policy change. For instance, the presence of ministries or lobbies that are, let's say, mm, develop policies for that specific sector. So what we saw, on, and here you see on the left, is that um, the uh, largest banks in the world have a portfolio which is highly exposed to climate policy relevant sector. And on the right, what we did with a financial network model was to first translate the exposures into an adjustment in uh, financial valuation of the contracts. Uh, in 2017, we focused on equity holdings. Now we further developed it into for bonds and uh, loans as well. And then we translated the adjustment in financial valuation into adjustment in financial risk metrics. The standard is the uh, value at risk. So we calculated the climate value at risk for uh, the la uh, largest banks, for instance, in Europe. Here on the right, you see actually two colors of the bar. So the value at risk for banks that you might know quite well. So Deutsche Bank, Credit Agricole, and so far. And what are the two different colors? So the dark colors are the first round losses, while the light colors are the second round losses. So the losses that take into account financial interconnectedness, so reverberation of losses in the financial network. Because we coupled uh, the financial uh, um, climate adjusted financial valuation model with a financial network model. Next slide, please. 
This shows actually how a firm and an investor can do climate financial risk assessment. So the standard way to do it is via climate stress test. So recently you hear uh, quite often now in the news that central banks have either developed their own climate stress test and asked uh, banks and insurance companies to run their supervisory scenarios in their climate stress test exercises. The last one was reported by the ECB uh, one week ago. But what is a climate stress test? So this is the structure that we developed in 2017, and that's now, let's say, became uh, mostly a standard when you look at the other climate stress test. So on the top, on the left, we start from scenarios of emissions that would allow us to uh, emission concentration that would allow us to stay either within the 1.5 or 2 degrees targets. These scenarios are provided by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change reports that are published every seven years. Then these uh, um, emission trajectories are translated into outputs of economic activities that depending on their um, energy technology being either uh, renewable, which is the box on the left, wind, for instance, wind-based electricity, or uh, fossil fuel, the box on the right, gas-based electricity, will face either a positive or negative shock in output. These trajectories uh, of output by economic activities are provided now by the Network for Green Financial System scenarios. What then, this output is then the uh, projections on output is then translated in our internal model into a scenario adjusted financial valuation. Here you see an example for corporate bonds, for different, uh, for electricity production out of different technologies, with of course opposite results for uh, fossil fuels based or renewable based, and then into the adjustment in here the budget risk, so distribution of losses. The distribution of losses, however, takes into account the fact that the investor is also, for instance, a bank, is interconnected in a network of banks. So actually there is kind of risk reverberation. Next slide, please. So what, also will, uh, what we learned also are the knowledge gaps that still persist. The first one is about climate scenarios for climate stress tests. We argued in our recent paper published on science that uh, scenarios don't account for the role of finance looking at the same scenarios and affecting the trajectories. The second issue is about what is a climate stress test? Because now it became quite widespread, but we are somehow losing the understanding of what a stress test, a climate stress test is. It's a balance sheet stress test, like central bank uh, regulators does, do, and it's forward looking, so conditioned to the scenarios. And in this context, the relevant scenarios are the scenarios of the net supervisory scenarios of the network for green financial system, not ad hoc carbon pricing scenarios. And the third point and main challenge is disclosure and potential greenwashing. And today, since we are talking at also at firm level, I would really like to address this problem. When we talk about climate risk, climate financial risk disclosure, it seems that everything is right now because, I mean, if we look at uh, economic analysis and research analysis, they are flourishing because there is growing availability of data. However, this data actually uh, should be considered with a grain of salt. There are several limitations that include uh, GAG emissions quality, because often we tend to forget that still scope one and scope two emissions are estimated by the data provider because they are not even provided by the companies, while scope three, even when provided by the companies, they have major issues and we will see soon what does it mean. Then second, we still lack a taxonomy of carbon stranded assets. So of the assets that are at risk of uh, losing value. So far we only have, uh, with several issues, uh, taxonomy of sustainable activities in the European Union. And third, we still lack a forward looking dimension because so far the forward looking dimension is considered in terms of uh, decarbonization plans of companies that sign, for instance, net zero, but Nobody tell us, I mean, how good this, uh, if these plans will realize. Next slide, next slide, please. So, and here I just would like to conclude with an example of 
what does it mean not taking these issues into account when we do financial risk analysis and in this case uh, portfolio rebalancing analysis this is an analysis that we are uh, it's forthcoming on journal portfolio management where we looked at how the european central bank could rebalance its portfolio by this decreasing its exposure to climate transition risk by uh, without largely affecting its uh, uh, market neutrality principle by, uh, however, considering taking into account the issues about the GAG scope one, scope two, scope three information and ESG score, so environmental social governance risk. Uh, well, this then, uh, if you listen to the news last week, the European Central Bank right said that uh, it's going to integrate climate climate into its uh, uh, monetary policies by a climate tilting, which was actually what we proposed in the, in the paper. However, the devil is in the details, because the ECB proposed to do climate tilting, considering best in class, so climate uh, aligned firms based on their emissions, so GAG one, scope one, two, and three, and forward looking plans. Now, considering the issues in, uh, let's consider the issues in uh, with GAG emissions uh, that is are represented here in the table that we present on the right. Here, what you see are a list of issuers. You might recognize some names from the uh, utility, NL, uh, NGA, A2A, and in the box below, you have issuers from the um, automotive, automotive companies like uh, um, Stellantis, Volkswagen. The second row uh, indicates the indirect renewable capacity that is provided by their um, documents, by the um, actually uh, the annual statements. And the third row indicates scope one, two, and three declared emissions. Now, let's look at two companies that belong to the same uh, sector. So, uh, automotive, let's take Stellantis as in Volkswagen, the bottom two. Uh, and what we see is that despite they have ne they declare an average fleet emissions, their emission, uh, their scope one, two, and three is largely different. They differ by 40 times. And what we found in the paper is that this is due to the fact that uh, while Volkswagen follows the reporting standard for scope three, the <laughs> Stellantis did not at that time. These of course have major implication when you wanna do portfolio rebalancing because you might consider with this information Stellantis as let's say uh, more climate aligned and so rebalance your portfolio by more bonds of Stellantis instead than Volkswagen. Good, very good Irene. Uh, I'm sorry, but I need to control a little bit the time. I'm done. Good, very good. I think that, uh, uh, you know, you pointed exactly with this beautiful example, what is the main issue that is exactly to create a standard and some enforcement in the way that at the end you have uh, information from the different firms that can at least to be compared in a reasonable way. And uh, I think that uh, on this issue regarding disclosure, I'm asking to Martin to, you know, step in and clearly tell us something about, on one side, disclosure in general, how important it is. But given that the exposure draft is also pointing on one aspect that is also important, that is uh, how the, it, that it is in a sense that the firm has to declare a target. If you can also, uh, in some sense, uh, discuss what are the issues that fixing this target in the disclosure uh, might create it from the point of view of, of, of the firm. So, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Loriana and uh, Jan, uh, for uh, the kind invitation to participate in this panel. It's a great pleasure. I wish I could be with you in Frankfurt, but nevertheless, a great opportunity to uh, listen to all of these presentations. So, so what I wanted to talk about is uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how the framework of disclosure fits in uh, in a broader kind of uh, spectrum of uh, risk assessment uh, of uh, climate economics. And the way I like to think about it is I usually like to start from this idea of the decarbonization pathways that Irene also uh, a little bit uh, related to. So, so essentially, even in the uh, 
kind of absence of any physical risk. What I think is uh, happening right now is that there is a major drive from uh, several uh, stakeholders, including policymakers, but not only, but uh, individual stakeholders of companies to essentially try to think about uh, decarbonization their activities within the medium to long run kind of perspective. And I think what's important about that is that there is more and more kind of supervision that companies are actually proceeding on that uh, particular path. So for that to actually uh, have uh, any traction and any bite, of course, what is uh, critical uh, for anyone is to actually know how companies are actually uh, following up uh, on this uh, particular decarbonization pathway. So that's the kind of uh, broader motivation for why actually disclosure potentially is an important uh, consideration with this, because, uh, of course, uh, if the stakeholders are to assess uh, how well the company is actually progressing on the pathway, there has to be an information on which uh, you can uh, actually uh, make some kind of uh, assessment of that. And I, what I want to argue is that there are essentially two types of information that I think are critical here. So, so one, one can think of it are backward looking information. So this is what Irene was talking about in terms of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. That's essentially what the companies have already produced in the past. And the reason why this is important, even though this is a backward looking information, is essentially telling you what's the expected path for each individual companies to kind of experience in the future. So in other words, uh, what matters is that uh, if you know that the steady state is going to be a zero emission for an individual company, that level of emissions that you currently produce is going to be an essential information for you to actually uh, uh, manage your risk uh, as an individual company. But of course, what also matters is what's going to happen from today until uh, that future. And that's where I think the forward looking information becomes important as well. So, so when we talk about former forward looking information, of course, there are two ways to think about it. One way is to think of some kind of econometric models that are going to extrapolate the patterns from the past and tell us what that path potentially is going to be in the future. But the other one is to think about the companies kind of self predictions about where they think that path is going to be. And that's an interesting kind of movement that I think, Loriana, you have in mind when you also ask your question, which is that notion of commitments. I think commitments have become a big part of the climate economics right now. And to essentially answer your question in a broad sense, what companies commit to are two kind of pieces of information. They commit in terms of the steepness uh, or the kind of uh, scope of emissions that they want to reduce in a particular uh, uh, period, but they also commit uh, in terms of the uh, horizon in which they want to do it. And if you look at the information on commitments, the first thing you see is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in this regard. And uh, there is also, of course, a lot of uh, information that we don't know about individual companies. But again, just looking at basic initiatives like SBTI, CDP, I want to argue that uh, Commitments are becoming more and more uh, prevalent and more and more companies uh, are actually uh, joining this commitment uh, initiatives. So, so companies uh, do set these two types of uh, targets, the horizon and the, the, and the kind of scope of emissions reductions. And then you, of course, can ask yourself a question, how are they following through on that and how do they actually uh, manage that risk? So the first thing which is kind of uh, interesting to realize is that it's not really the company's oftentimes kind of self-action that determines these commitments initiatives. It's more that there is actually a pressure from outside stakeholders to actually do so. If you talk to a lot of companies, why is it that they actually make these commitments? Oftentimes they tell you they, we don't have a choice. Either the stakeholders demand that they make commitments or their peer uh, pressure essentially mandates that. So, so in some work I've done uh, with Patrick Bolton, we have, uh, for example, found that, uh, that the more actually companies within your industry actually make commitments, the more likely you are going to make commitments yourself. So clearly there is an evidence that uh, there is basically this pressure coming from uh, peers. And also we find that uh, all the stakeholder pressure, both the internal and external kind of uh, pressure, uh, matter to a great extent in the way how uh, companies actually decide uh, to make uh, uh, commitments. So now, of course, you could ask the question, is this like a free good? Uh, why is it that every company would not actually make commitments? And I think this is the kind of story of a flip uh, side to do it. 
there is of course a risk associated with that. And I want to think about it uh, in two ways. Uh, uh, one way, of course, is the idea that you need to kind of implement uh, the commitment into your uh, daily activity. So commitments, especially those which are actually more rigorous, like SBTI, which require the hard uh, submission of the data, they require some action on the side of companies. So either companies are going to change their production mix, or maybe they're going to sell some assets. Either way, it is going to be somewhat uh, a costly uh, operation for them. But the second one, which I think is equally important, and I don't think we still are seeing that, but I think we will be seeing that in the future very soon, given the economic environment we are living in, is this idea of reputational risk. Essentially, there is a big risk that uh, companies may actually not be able to deliver on their commitments. And these assessments from many of the initiatives are actually pretty uh, frequent. So SBTI, for example, does a triannual assessment. So essentially, every three years, you need to kind of show what's your delivery on the commitment you made. And uh, there is a risk that if you actually cannot deliver on your commitment, that can be costly in terms of your capital, it can be costly in terms of your stakeholder base and any kind of daily operation that uh, companies actually undertake. So just to give you some idea for how actually companies fear this risk, there is one interesting fact that uh, I have found in, in, in one of the research that I've done, which is essentially when companies make commitment decisions, they typically have a choice when to start actually counting emissions in the past. This is what we call a base year choice. So say we are in 2022 and we have a company that makes a commitment. That company could, for example, say from the period 2015 until 2030, we want to reduce emissions, say, by 40 percent, just to give you an example. So you see that even though we are in 2022, company has a right to look backward in the data to choose that base year, which actually seems to be an interesting choice because essentially it helps you to kind of mitigate that risk of not meeting commitments. From the perspective of a company that is worried actually about uh, not meeting this commitment, naturally you would expect that companies are going to choose the year when the emissions uh, were the highest. Because essentially by uh, choosing that year, they are getting the free kind of already pass because they know that they have already reduced these emissions coming to 2022. And you look at the data, and that's exactly what you find. That companies that have the highest emissions are typically the companies that actually are choosing that base year when their emissions were the highest in the past. So that kind of tells you that companies are internalizing that risk that they may not actually make the uh, uh, commitments in the future, so they are perfectly aware of the reputational kind of uh, concerns associated uh, with this particular uh, drive. So maybe in the interest of time, I just want to uh, make uh, one extra uh, point, which is, of course, there is a challenge, as uh, Irene has uh, mentioned, of uh, comparability of the data, like with different uh, companies can be kind of living in different uh, a reporting environment, and not every company necessarily is going to uh, follow exactly the same protocol. But I think there is quite a lot of push right now among the regulators, among the policymakers to kind of streamline it. And I expect that this is going to become actually quite a serious uh, policy agenda for the next uh, couple of years. Just to give you some idea, the recent regulation we had uh, both out of European Commission and the uh, Security Exchange Commission in the United States have both gone in the direction of mandating more of this information. And uh, commitments and disclosure of emissions are clearly uh, the big item of the uh, agenda. And I think what's important to also recognize is that uh, if we want to think about the decarbonization pathways, we really are talking about absolute level of emissions rather than anything else. So this is related to Irene's other point on greenwashing. Companies oftentimes try to mimic the true kind of activity by using some kind of secondary uh, measures of uh, disclosure. And as we observe the regulation, uh, essentially, this is getting more and more uh, banned or, uh, say, ruled out from a lot of the regulatory frameworks. And, and I think there will be a push to go into something which is more comparable, more unified across uh, many different companies. 
And of course, this is going to create uh, quite a bit of uh, pressure on uh, a lot of these companies to actually uh, deliver on uh, what's expected of them. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you very much. I think that it is extremely important, you know, that uh, you are stressing the fact that, uh, you know, there is a sort of peer pressure. So, and clearly, one of the main sources of, uh, of information for firms is accounting. That's why, you know, we are having this, uh, this, this conference and really uh, try to debate on this exposure draft that is really pushing on creating a sort of coordination that will then eventually, you know, also push on this direction of creating a peer pressure in providing, you know, information to the different stakeholders of the firm, starting from the clients to the investor and uh, and so on. Um, I'm moving now to, uh, you know, to Enrico, that clearly is really uh, on, on the side of the firm that need to address this problem day by day. So pretty much, you know, the main problem that you that you are uh, having is really how to respond to this demand for having information. And pretty much what I was asking you to debate is on the exposure draft that is focusing on the importance of having a body responsible for climate risk in the firm, a board mandate date and a clear definition and disclosure of the frequency by which the body is informed about climate related matters. So pretty much I will be happy if you can discuss about the governance that you have into the firm in providing them this type of information. So how crucial are these aspects and how difficult and costly? Because we, we heard that uh, a lot of firms that do not want to do it, they say that it's too costly to have to provide all this information and to have maybe a body in a firm that uh, Pre, in some sense, presidiate this type of information. Enrico. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I would take before a little uh, step back, because in order to understand how much a company is ready to uh, invest a matter of time, a matter of money in the sustainability projects, we first have to, uh, each company first has to understand why it's following its sustainability project and uh, uh, and uh, how uh, and which it, with what aim uh, we are uh, we are doing that. Let's say that uh, from the Adora's uh, side, sustainability is a natural part of our business because uh, we do think that sustainability is a part of a general way of thinking about the well-being of the planet of everybody. So it's sport. It's just a part of sport, as well as the Adora is a company very focused on innovation. And innovation has to be sustainable. Sustainability has to be a form of innovation. So it's naturally part of our business. If we start with this premise, thinking that it's part of our business, next step is being conscious that it has to be treated with like any other aspect of, um, of the business. Sustainability for us is like a marathon. I'm sorry if I go on with sports uh, metaphors, but we are sports persons inside here. So that doesn't matter your single step, they don't matter. It matters to have a long-term objective and to have the head commanding over your legs. The body is not naturally projected to do a marathon. As well, it's not a natural part of an old-style enterprise to think about sustainability. But the head and the directors have to have full control on that. And the head has to say to the legs, you can do the marathon. And the board has to say to the whole company, we can do, do that. First step is to have sustainability in the company thought as a brand value and to have your own definition of sustainability because unluckily uh, the term is uh, a little bit immaterial in a general sense. You have to transform it in a company um, brand value. For the Adora, for example, sustainability is a stimulus and inspiration to change. And this change has to be responsible, has to be inclusive, has to be competitive. So sustainability as a key to be inclusive, as a key to be competitive with, uh, with the market. 
this value, besides being defined, has to be a part of general feeding of the company. Uh, we uh, founded our uh, sustainability department, so uh, an office in the company, which has the, uh, the aim to design the governance and long-term objectives of our sustainability projects uh, five years ago. The first period was dedicated to build a sustainability conscience inside the company. It was pointless to say and um, to fix the objective if the company wasn't following following them. The company is made of persons, and person has to be aboard in each and every single uh, single project. In the meantime, that uh, they they were doing that the, the sustainability office. We started putting down the first milestones of our sustainability project, divided in uh, uh, milestones in uh, products. So our first sustainable products, or more sustainable product, because a thing like a sustainable, absolutely sustainable product doesn't exist simply because we consume uh, resources to do it for how much sustainable the company the product might be. Um, sustainability objective in corporate activities and sustainability objectives in our uh, supply chain. As, um, as I told you, uh, so far uh, we have studied some uh, sustainable, more sustainable products and we, uh, we put inside our production cycle, uh, circle some uh, sustainable or more sustainable materials just like uh, uh, sustainable cotton and avoiding using uh, uh, non-necessary animal uh, materials like kangaroo leather or like fur. We abolish them. The kangaroo leather, for example, the first sports company in the world to abolish kangaroo leather for surface shoes as being the adora. Uh, we have uh, other uh, things done in the packaging. All of our packaging uh, is uh, certified uh, with a sustainability feature, let's say, uh, from the boxes uh, to the envelopes of uh, our uh, T-shirts and uh, uh, other activities in the corporate part. So in the way the company relates inside and to the outside world. Uh, collaboration with the Paris Center of Peace in, uh, in Jaffa, Israel, to provide them with sports materials uh, and uh, to have uh, Israeli and Palestinian girls playing with our products and starting to live together and to play together and to communicate together is a first step towards a more just society also there. And uh, uh, as well as always in the uh, corporate uh, part, uh, our HR department is working in collaboration okay, with Rico, the just one minute i have one so how difficult it was you know to implement this type of thing so how you know the company at the end uh, uh, also the, let's say on one side the employee and uh, and the rest also your uh, uh, your clients on one side and the uh, and the provider of the, of the uh, furniture uh, uh -huh. look to this type of change in your company it was something that it was uh, easy to implement or it was costly or it is just you know something due to fashion ah. that in this period is good to do so i guess that having the single activities on sustainability even though coordinating coordinated sorry by the sustainability office has not been uh, been difficult. It has been more costly than doing them in a, in a not sustainable way, at least apparently, because then you have to consider all the hidden costs and all the hidden uh, problems that uh, uh, not following the sustainability path would uh, would have. Uh, uh, on the internal part, uh, it has been more difficult, but the mission has been accomplished finally to make people understand that uh, having only these connected single non-organic uh, sustainability activities is doing greenwashing. And uh, that we have a long-term sustainability program just like we have a long-term business plan. That has been a little bit uh, more difficult, making people understand that 
sustainability is a piece of business and it's not only I want to do uh, things better because our president uh, is a good hearted man uh, who wants things done in a, in a more human way. It's business, it's not, it's not my will. It, it's my will as well, but uh, they are not listening to me, so I can say my will is uh, completely irrelevant in, <laughs> from this point of view. It's part okay. of the business. That has been more and more, way more difficult to make people understand uh, that even though in a company like Theodora, well, the mean age uh, of the people is around 32, 35, so it's completely a millennia company, it is uh, up to a point natural to people to think uh, that way. But being able to think away and uh, realizing that is your business that has to be has to be done that way is uh, is slightly different. So that's that has been the more difficult uh, part. Okay. As far as the external impact uh, is concerned, uh, mm, well, again. Uh, given that we are in what they say in Latin, uh, camera caritatis, or that's your own, it's only you listening to me now. I honestly, though, I couldn't care less about uh, what uh, people say of my sustainability project for two reasons. Once, I'm not communicating anything that I'm not sure it is a certified. So I'm not communicating a, a lot. Uh, I always joke to my sustainability and intangible manager. I say to her, you are the only one who is more keen in doing brown washing than green washing. You cover your green things, <laughs> but anyways. And uh, on the other side, uh, given that they are real, expecting an opinion is like expecting an opinion on your brand values, example. Do you agree that the Adora is a sports company? What can I say to you if you do not agree? Look another for another company. I cannot change my way to be for you that you do not you do not agree the Adora being what it actually is. So uh, that's why the, the, the external part, uh, excluding I'm excluding possible lies which were not uh, telling, which, which were not telling. I I don't care absolutely about <laughs> external reactions. Okay, I so you know, but the big problem is that we don't know how many entrepreneurs are like you. But I think that uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, to collect a question now on to the to the speaker. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, they give uh, an overview of the different dimension under which they, let's say, yeah. they are looking to uh, to the issue regarding uh, the, the disclosure. So I wonder maybe, if you have maybe questions. Maybe only a quick one. follow up yes. on a thing you asked me about the, the governance. Yeah. The um, SNI, Sustainability Intangible uh, Office, is a direct report to our CEO, just any other crucial business uh, uh, activity, crucial business deciding uh, uh, point, as is a direct report to our uh, CEO, and uh, they inform uh, quarterly the board about the progression. As the board is informed on how sales go, on how communication and aid advertising, uh, advertising goes, with the same, uh, uh, in the same time frame, they are informed uh, about uh, sustainability uh, progress in our sustainability. So, yeah, it seems that really governance again is important, also for producing this type of uh, of information and enforcing really the the commitment of the firm. I'm happy to collect a question. Yes, Tobias. Um, <clears throat> thanks so much. So I think I, I want to follow up on one point that Marcin and uh, also in other uh, panels the interventions have made, which is how can we make these commitments credible? And one way of saying that, or one way you suggested, is um, making the disclosure forward-looking more detailed. And you've contributed also to the literature, which says that has a competitive effect, right? So there's a there's a cost factor to that. Um, because it sort of punishes the most in innovative firms because they have to disclose essentially some of their, well, edge actually. And I don't know how you want to, particularly in the field of ESG and, and sustainability disclosure, how you want to uh, somehow fix the trade-off or at least uh, address it somehow? Yes. 
So I don't know, uh, Loriana, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, go Martin. With... Let's. We are. Uh, you know, we we are answering one by one. It's fine. Okay. So I don't know if uh, I have the right to speak first. I'm happy to give the floor to other speakers first. But since I was uh, called. Uh, I, I do agree with the point that Tobias has made. It's absolutely true that from the perspective of company, there is a cost that could be associated with the potentially proprietary information that is being disclosed in this kind of so-called carbon disclosure. So, so one thing that I have found in some of the research I've done in the past, and I'm sure you are aware, Tobias, of that, is that when one country, for example, goes to mandate disclosure, Oftentimes what you see, the rate of incidence uh, of disclosure also goes up in the countries that are connected to that country. So specifically what I have in mind is that the U United Kingdom has instituted mandatory disclosure rules in 2013. And surprisingly what you found is that uh, countries which are in the European, especially jurisdictions, they actually responded to that by increasing their disclosure rates uh, more. So in this regard, you could say that that's net effect. Companies seem to take that as a kind of net benefit rather than the net cost. And then you can say, like, what else can we see as an evidence of that? So clearly what we see is that valuation of companies that are potentially on track at the time when they disclose is actually improving. So these companies get higher multiples relative to what their counterfactual would be had they not disclosed this information. So... So again, I'm not trying to argue that there is no cost. What I'm trying to argue is that there seems to be a net benefit, at least for these voluntary disclosure, disclosures. And of course, there is a clear selection in this. We don't know what would be the uh, alternative for those who do not disclose, but uh, that's kind of where I think the science is, at least in terms of the numbers on that particular question. Okay, please. Is the, if there is also some question from the audience, In remote yeah yeah thanks um, very interesting talks so, um, I'm uh, yeah I'm concerned also work-wise with some um, biodiversity loss and it's very clear that the the biggest driver on land is our land use transitions and in the ocean it's fisheries there's big um, scientific consensus on this so wishful thinking of course would be that companies could report their impact on land use transitions such as deforestation in the tropics, normally by fire, just burning the forest, or maybe also having less and less agricultural <laughs> land without pesticides applied to it in, in Central Europe. But this wishful thinking that companies, you know, <laughs> would be able to report it, and it might even sound, you know, justified in a, in a world with less and less land available. I mean, is it realistic or is it mission impossible for companies to do this? their land use impact, the impact on land use transitions, which are crucial for biodiversity. Is it mission impossible to report that, or is it feasible and maybe even desirable? Yeah. Let's see if some of the speaker. Uh, well, uh, reporting uh, um, I do think that with science-based targets, uh, you, we could have a way to report uh, how much we, we, we consume. Uh, other thing is uh, having the instruments to immediately improve our uh, impacts uh, on, on deforestation and on bio biodiversity. Obviously, uh, um, coming from the shoes business, uh, 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 we do not, we are not touched by the, the fisheries because uh, uh, there are no shoe made of uh, fish uh, skin. They are made uh, of, uh, of cattle leather, which uh, unluckily is a part uh, of uh, the, a, a big part of the issue. Let's say that, uh, again, we could work in the marathon style I was talking to you about. There are marginal aspects of the business that do have an important uh, impact on biodiversity. The kangaroos I was, I was telling you, or uh, the, the fur in the, in, in, in the shoes. There are some small steps we can make that we can take them quickly because they do not have a huge impact on the business. 
because unluckily I have also to remind that uh, sustainability for a company is also remaining in the market and growing and making the territories and people working for you richer, even though in a responsible way. So we can start with the small steps, small for the company, but more important for the impact that they have. And uh, then uh, uh, starting the way to, 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 reduce, uh, to reduce the impact. Uh, I have to confess that uh, the main um, issue for us would be to reduce the consume of cow, cattle, leather. We are doing in dedicated uh, collection. We are not doing uh, in, a, in a general, uh, in the general collection because uh, of cost issues on one side and the public not being fully prepared to do that uh, you know, on the other way. But uh, where we could do it, we already done it. We have uh, vegan uh, collections that have for sure a uh, smaller impact on, on bio biodiversity. Okay. If I understand, some, if, some if I answer to you. Something done. Uh, please, from, uh, from the... Oh. Yes. So from online, online from audience. line, yes, please. Uh, so this one is on greenwashing, uh, which has been defined in an ISO standard uh, focused on green finance. Some discussions suggest that greenwashing in financial community has the potential to undermine trust. Uh, there was a lot of talk about already. Mm -hmm. But how how critical do you think this is? How critical is greenwashing? Yeah, so yeah this the, is maybe. the question. Yeah, maybe Loriana, I could start on this if this. Okay, could. good. Yeah, because we have a paper analyzing uh, well, to what extent universal, universal investors uh, uh, are walking their sustainability talk. And this could be a very good example because, you know, I mean, uh, institutions like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, I mean, they represent, uh, they manage, <laughs> I mean, a very uh, um, large part of the, of the, of the market. So, what we saw so far is that uh, the, uh, while these companies increase the ESG score, in particular the E, through time, uh, in particular since the Paris Agreement, well, this was not really full, re reflected in their uh, divesting from uh, fossil fuel or activities that we classified into uh, directly or indirectly contributing to um, fossil fuel business. So this is huge because and this is huge also uh, let me say connected to what we see in terms of regulation because here we uh, and so this is connected also to the previous two uh, questions because here we say okay how good firms uh, could be on the market i mean their financial performance or their reputation if they uh, right to do disclosure well, yeah, but we should consider that standards change. And this, I mean, we had an example with the EU taxonomy just uh, last week. And standards change uh, due to uh, policy and political commitment. So if we want firms to really engage in disclosure and in change and adjust their business, we need stable and credible policies. Because without that, we will not have, uh, we will just have large uncertainty and with large uncertainty about what can be classified as sustainable and in particular what is not sustainable, actually we will uh, not be able to make the transition in the time needed, which is five years. May I add something, Gloriana, to that? Yes, I don't please. know if this is yes, your Martin, plan yes. on that. I think uh, part of what I found an interesting idea, and I know it's a little bit controversial, but for the sake of the panel, I think uh, it's good to always bring some controversy, is that we as economists, at least, oftentimes think of a price solution as a solution to the climate problem, in a sense that there is a lot of discussion or oh, what kind of uh, price penalty we can put on these companies, uh, what cost of capital they are going to pay, etc. But I think these are kind of indirect measures. And, and I think really, if you think about at least the carbon problem, and I, I acknowledge the fact that the problem of climate is not just carbon, but there is more to it, like uh, what my other speakers have said, biodiversity, etc. I think we should also think of the quantity-based system, which is you should be actually enforcing uh, directly through the reduction, rather than just hope that if we put some kind of... Uh, 
price mechanism in place, call it carbon tax, etc. This is going to actually lead to a response of the corporate sector that is supposed to do it. So, so I find that there is this disconnect between the, what I call the first stage, which is putting the pressure, and the second stage, which is really the big elephant in the room, which is the decarbonization. So let me give you just an example from my own country. I'm from Poland. So we have the carbon uh, tax system, I mean the permit system, of course, the, within the European Union. And the story is, OK, we are going to increase the price on this uh, carbon permit. So these companies will have to basically pay higher price. So they are going to decarbonize. So here is how it works. You sell this uh, basically permits as a government. You, co uh, you basically collect the money. And then what you do, you subsidize directly the same sector that is supposed to be penalized. So essentially, this is nothing else but just putting money from one pocket to another pocket. So this is how uh, the price system works uh, when the system is actually ill-designed. So, so whereas if you put a system which is quantity-based, it doesn't matter whether the money went from one uh, pocket to another, because ultimately what you are going to mandate is essentially how much the company pollutes, not uh, what was the price at which it was trading actually its permits or not. So, so I think we should be a little bit careful how we think about the prices versus quantities in this whole debate uh, of uh, decarbonization. And broadly speaking, this also relates to this notion of greenwashing, because, of course, a lot of these metrics in some sense oftentimes are designed in a way that is very easy to kind of go around them. So that's why I said like measures like intensity, by now I think most people think they are easy to manipulate. So they are not credible in a way how they are used by, uh, by market participants. So, so that's kind of what I wanted to say. Good, yes, please. This is a question which is primarily going to Marcin as well, and this refers to the forward-looking um, information that is being sought. Um, you said yourself that this is largely qualitative information, if you didn't say it, other people were also saying it. Um, you talked about how that could be gamed, and yes, that's all very clear because of what uh, start date you choose. And, what you could possibly do about that but if i make forward commitments that are forward from now so i do have a baseline which we can all agree upon what happens when i fail to meet my commitments how do i explain that and who is going to assess the validity of my assessment because we all know in the football game how I would have scored except the wind had to be blowing in the wrong direction at the last moment or the sun was in the goalkeeper's eye at just the last moment and if it wasn't for that and I hadn't stubbed my toe against the uh, touchline you know sort of half an hour earlier we would have won there's always there uh, that is the problem with these qualitative assessments of something into the future where somebody has got to mark it who is going to be marking it and how well martin this is for you i'm sorry again <laughs> well so i mean one way to think about it is uh, of course some of these initiatives themselves take as bti they are the in the process of actually uh, assessing these uh, commitments on a periodic basis so in a kind of direct way you could argue that uh, the very same uh, organization that sets up the system is going to be the one that is also going to review it I'm not saying that this is a perfect governance. We have heard some stories about SBTI itself uh, having some governance issues, but there is a system. But what I want to also argue is that uh, market-based system in this regard also is quite interesting. So let me give you one example, I, which I hope is going to give you some uh, idea of that. So I have done some work with my colleague Jose Luis Pedro on commitments of banks. So essentially what banks do is they commit uh, to decarbonization. Of course, they themselves don't produce emissions, so they, they, they want to decarbonize the portfolios that they, of assets that they hold. And here is the interesting story. When banks make commitments, the companies that they actually try to put pressure on, they actually tend to uh, say, oh, our e-scores improve. You see it in the data, the MSCI kind of ratings go up. But when you look under the hood, what you see is essentially they're just uh, disseminating a lot of soft information of the type we think climate is important rather than saying, oh, we reduced emissions by this or that. And what's interesting is if you look at the bank response to that, banks don't seem to buy it. What we observe is that even though companies improve their ESG kind of standing, just the soft metric, the bank really conditions their decision of credit on hard information, such as level of emissions, 
or potentially commitments. But it's really largely about the real carbon footprint that these companies actually produce. So, so what I'm saying is that there is also a market force that could potentially be a useful a mechanism by which we are going to review this kind of commitments. So, uh, so thank you. My question is for uh, Irene and uh, Martin as well um, about um, how climate risks um, actually affect firms' decision making. I was wondering, um, given the fact that some firms are expecting or can reasonably expect some uh, compensation for physical risks or transition risk, um, for example, the damage they suffer under a physical event or for, uh, for uh, stranded, uh, their stranded assets receive some compensation from the, uh, from the states. I was uh, wondering how this can affect their incentives in terms of um, uh, addressing physical risk or uh, transitioning to, to more, uh, more sustainable operations. Irene? Yeah. So, uh, actually, the extent to which firms are already assessing and considering climate risk in their business model, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, not, very, uh, it's not very high. And the reason is that it's uh, do climate financial risk assessment, in particular when it comes to um, physical risk, in the right way, I mean, science-based way, it's very complex, and firms uh, simply don't have the expertise. Uh, banks and uh, financial institutions have been forced by their regulators to build this expertise in the last year and a half, but it's challenging. And indeed, I mean, uh, on Friday, the ECB uh, published the report of the supervised climate stress test exercise saying that two thirds of firms, actually uh, two thirds of banks, sorry, didn't uh, have uh, climate, uh, robust climate stress test in place and most of them lack data. So, this is something which we uh, need to work uh, more. And that's why also have a clarity on the standards, which means we have a clarity of where we want to be in terms of uh, decarbonization of the economy in, uh, uh, in 5, 10, uh, 20 years is fundamental to allow firms invest in this. Then on the incentives and compensation, yeah, there could be an issue you say, Okay, like in the US, when there is uh, the state who uh, actually uh, supported uh, uh, with insurance uh, and then uh, for houses, uh, I mean, even uh, luxurious houses in flood risk area, then there was more hazard. So people buying the, the houses. This, of course, could happen, but we should consider what Martin said. So the fact that uh, actually there is this policy incoherence, you have uh, subsidies for companies that pollute, and that this, even in Europe. So if we talk about fossil fuel subsidies, this is even in Europe, even we, before this crisis. And, uh, and then you impose them standards. So in the end, uh, how is it going to pay? And also we should consider, I mean, which government would have the financial um, ability to provide compensation, because if we look at, I mean, we are uh, uh, exiting two years of COVID, with, which left severe implications on the economy and on public uh, debt of governments, and we are entering a potential recession, global recession, so I mean, <laughs> it will be challenging uh, for a lot of governments to provide compensation. Martin, do you want to add? Uh, just uh, one little thing maybe to say. I, I think uh, one of the issues which I think is quite relevant in the discussion is the issue of timing and where we are in this process. I think uh, to many companies, at least the way I think about it, they still think that this is some kind of transitory pressure. And I think they don't take it seriously. And let me give you one example. Like when you see what companies do in response to some kind of stakeholder pressure, and you take just a simple trade-off. Are they going to decarbonize their operation or are they going to actually shed assets that are the least profitable inside the business to kind of overcome that pressure? Guess what? Companies are mostly thinking about the profit margin rather than the decarbonization. So, so that kind of tells you that uh, they think that this is just like a short-term kind of uh, behavior, you know, that they have to play. And my expectation is a little bit what Iran said. I don't think this is going away. Despite of what we hear on certain media as to how it is that we need to go back to the, you know, fossil fuels and how we made the crucial mistake of going in that direction, there is so much pressure and there is so much tide coming from different angles 
that I think it is in the corporate interest to actually start thinking about this seriously, rather than just thinking that uh, this is just uh, yet another fad, or there is going to be some magic vaccine like we got in the context of COVID that is going to solve the problem. So I just want to make everyone, at least my view is, there is no magic vaccine coming, okay? So it is all coming through the hard work. And uh, yeah, and I'm not saying this is probability one event, but uh, the probabilities are definitely high enough to take them seriously. Let's put it this way. Okay, good. So I would like to ask if you can upload then the slides for, uh, you know, the, the part that uh, Andrew were planning to, uh, to give in terms of, let's say, how also biodiversity can be included in this type of uh, debate that, you know, it has been already stressed a little bit. But there is still time for another question. Do you have another question from the online? Is there any other? Otherwise, yeah, please. In the mean, yeah, please go in the meanwhile that they are turning on. Yes, please. Uh, I don't have a question. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, so you know, he was giving this talk and the reason why I, I want to include, I want to include, yeah, is over. <laughs> I want, maybe after, I'm sorry. Uh, he wants, uh, you know, he was part of this, uh, of this talk is that because, you know, at the WFA that is one of the main important, let's say, conference in finance, he was exactly, you know, talking about how also biodiversity can be included into the picture of finance. And if you move to the next uh, slide, what he was in a sense stressing is that, uh, uh, you know, he wrote this type of article that I'm inviting all of you to read, where he was really trying to point, let's say, some different potential starting point on which we can get include all the debate about biodiversity into the uh, finance landscape. Go to the next, uh, you know. We have a long, long discussion on the fact that there are no data, but uh, you know, at least from his perspective, there is already uh, a lot of, let's say, provision of information about, uh, in some sense, how really bio biodiversity on one side can create problem, and on the other side, you know, where you can also get data to figure out what are, let's say, uh, the implication in terms of investment and, and so on. And if you move to the next slide, uh, clearly his main point is that as for climate change, an important role can be played by regulation. Regulation that is not forcing only to take care about climate change, but also about uh, uh, biodiversity. And here there is already evidence about this type of regulation. And I'm asking you know, to my colleague from the legal point of view, from the law side, to start also to investigate how enforceable this type of regulation can be really in place. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Clearly, finance is responding not only with green bonds, but also with blue bonds. Blue bonds or reno bonds or uh, uh, all these other type of bonds that are in some sense trying really to preserve biodiversity and rather than having bonds that are related to, let's say, emission, they are bonds that are contingent on the fact that you are preserving, for example, forest or, uh, you know, some type of animals in the, in the system. And clearly, there is already, these bonds are already issued. So clearly, there is uh, uh, evidence that you can provide tangible, if you want, you know, evidence and uh, link some performance to this type of, uh, uh, let's say, of, of characteristics. And if we go to the next slide. Reno bond, it's, you know, it is a bond that pretty much is uh, the cash flow, so the coupon of the bond will be higher or lower. So the firm will pay higher or a low, let's say, uh, coupon if they are able to preserve a certain number of rhin rhinoceront in a certain area. So pretty much you as an investor, you are set to receive a lower coupon if they are really committing to preserve in a certain area, this type of animals. But clearly, this is an example, just to give an idea that if you want, you can really do something also on this, uh, on this uh, dimension. And here he was, in a sense, posting several research questions. And one of these is, for example, how you can really uh, analyze by the different sector what type really of uh, biodiversity impact you may have uh, as you are doing for climate change. And, uh, you know, so clearly, uh, just to bring into the picture the fact that we have a long discussion so far on clearly emissions, scope one, scope two, or scope three, 
but uh, you know uh, there is space also for uh, discussing about how biodiversity can be really included in this debate and also how firm can start to disclose or issue bonds that are not some simply contingent on uh, emission, but also on this other type of, uh, uh, of aspects. And so I'm suggesting really, uh, unfortunately, you know, Andrew today cannot be here with us, but, uh, you know, clearly read his article. He's really pushing on this uh, dimension as well. Now we are going back to our panelists. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm also inviting, you know, uh, Martin and Irene to start eventually to be broad in their analysis about the impact and also include, uh, uh, let's say, biodiversity. I'm also, uh, I would like to thank Enrico for, you know, providing us, let's say, his view regarding this, uh, uh, the topic regarding how to, you know, to implement and really commit uh, uh, to, to be sustainable, clearly I would like to have a lot of companies, if all the companies, uh, you know, really will implement as you, you know, this type of, uh, of uh, aspects. We know that instead marching already told us is not so easy. And if we are giving some option to escape, uh, there is a significant number of firms that would, do try to escape. So we need really to be careful about, uh, on one side, greenwashing, and not only to impose, uh, uh, let's say, disclosure, but make it enforceable. I think that this is one of the most important things. And given that it's 4.30 and our time is over, I would like to thank uh, all you three for your time and also for the participant to uh, you know, ask questions. And we have now 15 minutes break. So thank you.